the original shock the woodworking community with 101 quality tips and tricks shoved into such a short amount of time. The sequel was royally derided for its tasteless jokes and poor pacing. And now comes the threequel that nobody asked for. Are you ready? Because I'm not. An advantage of a shellac finish is you can polish it afterwards. Bandsaws can cut sideways, just don't cut more than half the gullet. Tool marks are the design accents for hipsters. Free wood is the best wood. Noise canceling headphones are a real blessing in a modern shop. The hardest sale to make is to a first-time customer. The easiest to a be-back customers. First-time customers come in and buy because of the looks. Be-back customers come back and buy because of the function. So, make stuff that's more than just something pretty to look at. With only a soda can, you can leave artistic geometric patterns on your table saw. Dad! Keep a shoe cleaner by your back door. Your relatives will appreciate it. If you want the best material, you're going to have to hunt for it. As a hand tool romantic, even I've got to admit that these modern day cordless power planers do make a good alternative to planes like scrub planes or four planes. I mean, hogging off a sixteenth of an inch at a time <laughs> makes flattening tabletops and re bringing down boards a lot easier because you're burning electrons instead of calories. And neither the floor plan or the scrub plan really demand to be perfectly flat, and these aren't either. But it looks as close enough to go to our jointers and smoothers. For those of us older turners who have fragile skin, you need to wear sleeve protectors when you're in the shop to save your arms. Installing lights in your carport will give you 24 hour access to your shop annex. Hey! Who put the cars in here? Who turned on the rain? Steel and iron power tools and plus magnets are a match made in heaven. Making a perfectly fit drawer or shelf in the winter will mean you will bind up mid summer. You need to adjust your tolerances for your seasons. To drive your lap partner nuts, leave everything on the edge. Having a portable spotlight at the lathe is just a must, especially for those finishing cuts. Plus, you can pretend they're a microphone. When I'm doing maintenance on my tools, I often run across odd sized nuts and bolts, which I can't identify their size perfectly by eye. So I'll just take a quick impression and walk that back to my toolbox to get the exact size tool. If you want to use construction lumber for finer products, you need to go ahead and buy about a month before you're going to use it and let it fully dry by stacking and stickering it, which means putting space in between them all the way around, making sure it's even. Uh, that gets airflow going around. If all you do is stack it up, well, the board's in that sandwich will not have the airflow, so they won't dry out, so you might as well have just bought the wood straight from the store. Having it fully dry will keep make it stable so your finished piece won't move after it's built. Even with the best dust collector, your shop AC, whether it's a window unit or a mini split, needs extra filtration, even if it's just throwing an extra filter on top of the air intake. Ugh. Amazon gives you a new bench protector with every order. Selling your work is equal parts social interaction as inventory reduction. It's kind of fun getting out and meeting people when you're stuck in the shop all week. Increase the effectiveness of your hand planes for flattening your work by increasing their reference area. Do this by slightly skewing them while planning. That way you're still covering, referencing the same amount of area in front of the blade and behind the blade, but you're also capturing what's to the left and to the right. And do this alternating. That way you capture the most. 
Remember, all you want to do is take off the high spots. So if they're riding on the high spots, you're, only, you're not going to be shaving the low spots. Use a magnet in a plastic bag to collect all your metal shavings underneath your grinder. And then whenever you need to clean up the magnet, just pull it out of the plastic bag. PVC makes great holders for your tools, such as gouges, you know, drills, even supplies like sandpaper. And if you attach it onto a old wire shelf, it makes a great stop that's easy to clean out. Old dental picks can be used for more than just cleaning your teeth. One of the advantages tools like cabinet scrapers and scraper planes have over a card scraper is if you have really difficult woods, really curly woods or figured woods, which this isn't, uh, you can actually skew them a little bit and control them at that angle so you get more of a sheer scrape than a straight ahead scrape. The quickest way to turn the board into a bomb is to joint or plane the end grain because it turns the weakness of the wood to let it split and explode. Save your dust by species for later use as fillers. Pecan. For my general purpose tools like scrapers and this here pocket, general purpose pocket knife, I'm really finding I am liking these newfangled carbide scraper sharpeners, which they basically scrape an edge clean instead of grinding it down. See the metal shavings? And that is sharp. A normal pencil is a quarter inch thick. A Ticonderota is three eighths of an inch thick. And the leads are in the middle. So if you ever need those measurements or half those measurements, you can just use the pencil itself. Modern film is incredibly cheap. So be sure to archive your work from many different angles. But more importantly, figure out a way to organize that stuff. Because if you just stick it all in one folder, you're never gonna find it again, so what's the point of having an archive? At that point, it's just zeros and ones in your computer. 95% alcohol, 5% water. 95% alcohol, 5% poison in water. You make the smart decision. Cathedrals in wood, which are these sections that terminate like that, they are actually the grain, one single ring of a grain where it was either coming up or down. They are a good indication of which way the grain is going whenever you work the wood, because you always want to plane in the direction that the grain, the cathedral is pointing, because if you come back the other way, you'll be lifting up the fibers. And in this example, you are seeing something where the grain is reversing, because yeah, I would lift up the fibers coming this way. I would also lift up the fibers coming this way. So to plane this one, I would need to plane in this direction and also in this direction, which is why if you see cathedrals, you want to see cathedrals that are all pointing in one direction. I'm always saying it's all about the grain when you're working wood, because we as woodworkers get to control the grain alignment, the orientation, the cosmic, the contrast, the impact that the grain brings to the craft. But when you're working with plywood, you're just kind of stuck with whatever's convenient for the manufacturer to make. Even with the best dust collection, whether you're at the lathe or a sanding table, it is always nice to have a fan behind you. That keeps the breeze going away from you towards the dust collection, it eliminates a lot of smell and stuff like that. Plus it's just a nice feeling how that breeze is going over your neck. A low profit commodity product in your catalog would be kind of a drag on profits and productivity in the good times, but it also be a financial lifesaver in the down times. Cash flow is good. Your hand plane, whether wood or metal, is the most finicky hand plane you have in your collection. And because so, you have to make sure that the sole is perfectly flat. Well, not really. All you have to really focus on is the toe, the mouth, and the heel. Make sure those are in plane. In fact, with a wooden plane, you can actually take a card scraper and remove a little metal wood right here and right here. That'll create a recess that in use creates a slight vacuum. So on those final passes, it will really suck itself down and leaving a perfect finish. 
every woodworker should keep a handsaw in their vehicle for those emergency free wood acquisition opportunities. When using a marker on wood, whether it's flat or round, you always drag, you never push. Because pushing will ruin your tip and you'll never be able to get sharp lines again. You can verify your bandsaw is plumb by flipping a vertical cut. Pretty good. Horse mats are a really inexpensive way to add comfort to concrete floors. Though they're gonna stink a while, so maybe buy them and stick them outside for a couple weeks. You can find them at most farmer and market stores. Going across the grain is the quickest way to remove material, whether you are turning, carving, or planting, because basically you're severing the fibers on both sides and just splitting out the metal. Every shot needs a bug of salt. Working flat or round, smooth body motion gives a smooth cut. When sanding, start with the highest grit you can so you can minimize your work. If at all possible, stay away from 8100. I start with 180 if I can. When securing your work in a twin vise, it's best to put your work on one side to clamp it down snugly and then really clamp down on the other side. That'll disperse the wood, the pressure equally so you won't mar your work while really getting a strong hold. When cutting with a jigsaw, you want to focus on feeding the line directly into the teeth, straight on dandy as you move along, instead of following the line. Because if you're following the line instead of feeding the line, you end up twisting in the middle line, which deflects the saw blade, which causes a non-parallel cut, and you tend to wander off. Need a simple way to store your drills? Simply chuck up a hook screw. Makes the hanging stuff a lot easier. If you sand and you want a brilliantly smooth finish, you've got to burnish the wood before you apply your uh, finish. That's what brown paper is for. Brown paper bags should be your last sanding grit. Fat fingers make the best micro adjusters. Use sandpaper like you stole it. What are you doing? Don't feel like it's cheating using sandpaper and sanding devices to get those perfect shapes better than using abrasive since it's stone aging woodworking. Get it? Stone, abrasive. Damn it, Sean, if you had to explain a joke. Some species are prone to splotching whenever you use an oil finish, an absorbing finish. If you have one of those species, cherry's a hot prime example, I highly suggest using shellac as a first coat. Shellac is a universal finish. All other finishes will stick to it, but using it as a first coat, it will somewhat fill in the ingrained pores so it will absorb less oil, thus you'll get less splotching. Don't judge your shop by the shops you see on social media. I mean, people like me have spent 20 years collecting all our junk. I am sure that in 20 years, your shop is going to be so much better than mine for the simple reason tools progress. I am so jealous right now of the sonic screwdriver you're gonna be woodworking with in 20 years. If you're gonna scrape the inside of a bowl, use a thick, narrow radius scraper so do you have maximum control and can gouge out most of the material and finish up with a larger radius negative ray scraper to remove any tool marks and get a nice curve. Real metal paint comes as a powder, not a liquid in a can. If you're buying it in a can, all you're really doing is buying a milk paint palette. And if you buy it by the bag, go ahead and put it in a mason jar. Just use what you need. If you need it to last for a long time, I suggest putting in a, little, a few descants in with the powder. Fire bad customers! Don't make the mistake of choosing a wood species based upon the color it is when you are working it because all woods tend to converge in color over time. For example, we have a poplar box. I have a maple and cherry plane right here. I have a pecan box. I have a stick of maple right here, and I have pine. The back of my workbench is made out of pine, beech. These were a little bit newer, but if you notice, the hue of all of them have kind of converged. Freshly plain poplar will have a nice green, sometimes purple and cream color but over time it darkens and kind of mellows into the same shades as the other colors because this workbench is actually made from the same board this one was. It's just a little bit older. So pick the species you're going to be building out of 
based upon the color it will turn into in five or six years. And don't just assume that you can dye it to the hue you want from the get-go. Because if the underneath wood continues to darken over time, the whole piece, even if it starts out a little bit dark, will get even darker. You need to account for time. Your eyes see at a much higher resolution than you could ever get on a monitor. So I guarantee you, the images you see in social media do not look as good as they do in real life. So that means if you make a small error, don't sweat about it. You're probably going to forget about it in a few weeks. You're the only one that will ever notice it. Don't compare yourself to social media. Nobody's work ever looks this good. Well, except for Frank Straza. But he's the exception. If you're like me, you use your gas-powered power tools heavy but infrequently. After each use, I highly suggest you just kind of drain out all the gas and burn it out of the cart. Fire it up and burn it out so it's completely empty because it's going to go bad within a few weeks anyways. And the ethanol just wreaks havoc with a lot of old gaskets. When sharpening on your grinder, you want to use the highest grit you possibly can because it will remove less metal, get you a finer edge, and that finer edge will last longer. But if you are shaping on a grinder, you absolutely don't want to use the finest grit. You want to use your coarsest grit. It comes down to heat. Here's a scraper. I want you to notice how quickly it starts to blue on a 600 grit wheel. Almost instantly. See that? Now let's look at a really coarse wheel. I can sit here and grind on it for quite a while and it doesn't heat up. No color change, it's still cool to the touch. Less friction, less heat, lower grit. What's nice about having a mini lathe in your shop, even if you don't turn them, is you can set it up as a permanent buffing wheel. Keep some paraffin wax around your hollow chisel mortiser and as you're using it when it gets warm, just dabble it on the sides and on the threads. The heat will carry it up in there and it will work smoother in the wood, it will make a lot less noise and strangely the sawdust ejects easier despite common wisdom. From my understanding, you should never leave your lithium ion batteries on the charger full time, especially after they're fully charged because the constant trickle charging will actually reduce the life of the, these batteries. Plus. You don't want a lithium ion fire getting out of control. To repair rings or scratches in a slack finish, just rub it out with a little alcohol. To repair an oil and wax finish, just apply a little bit of oil and then after that dries, buff it with a buffing wheel. To repair a film finish, grab some sandpaper. And do a lot of sanding. Don't run away from a log that looks all worm-eaten because worms generally just like the part of the tree that has sugar in it, which is the sapwood. They generally turn back from the heartwood, which means the center of the trees is generally still clear. A straight edge will exaggerate flat spots in your curve. No matter what type of woodworking you do, the last little bit of sanding should always be done by hand and that one grit higher than the others and always going with the grain because slight scratches going with the grain will hide themselves. Anything going across the grain will really jump out and generally will attract oil so it will stand out even more after you apply finish. Last pass with the grain. Tear out is a common problem in wood turning and flat work. One of the ways to minimize tear out is use a very sharp tool on your last cut. A second way to minimize tear out is to spray area with alcohol and water being cut with a sharp tool. A third way to minimize tear out is coat the area with paste wax before you do the last shear cut. You can close the rings on your smartwatch's exercise app by carefully choosing what activity it's monitoring. When I'm at the lathe, I choose jump rope. One area of plain steel that very few people talk about is how it dulls. In an ideal world, we would sharpen it to 100% and it might dull down to 95% and stay there for the longest period of time and then all of a sudden get really dull fast. So we notice the difference. The worst kind of steel would be the kind of steel that dulls slowly, linearly, gradually, because then we never really notice when it goes dull and we end up pushing it too hard, too long, which can be dangerous. Kind of why I like O1 and PMV11 steels, the new one, the new powder metals, because when they go, I can notice the difference. If you have an open poured wood, 
you can use a low poundage shellac as a sanding sealer to fill the pores in the wood before your final sand. Slotted screws get a really bad rap nowadays because of the screwdrivers we use. All the screwdrivers are tapered and they sell those to us so that they can fit a wider range of screws. Unfortunately, when you taper it, all the pressure goes on the corners and it strips out, it doesn't hold or anything like that. A properly made screwdriver will be slotted perfectly to the size screw you are using. So it will fit in there, add force to the entire side and never come out. Anybody recognize that? I've had a screw on top of this the entire time. Slotted screws, awesome. Always cut downhill so your fibers are supported. If screw placement is critical, always start it with an awl. When you're done with your bandsaw, you want to detension the blade. Not so much for the blade, but for the tire. You don't want to indent that tire or get it out of round. And you also want to come up with some kind of system to tell you that your blade is detensioned. I would typically take the knob off the top and leave it on the table right in my, my way. To run balanced and true, every time you change your saw blades, you want to clean off your tires. And if you get any of those little sap boogers that really grind in there, a little toothbrush and alcohol will take them right off. When sanding, use alcohol to see scratches your eyes can't, to raise the grain, and to clean the fibers. Your hands feel will see imperfections before your eyes can. So while working on your projects, don't be afraid to feel your wood. That sounded pervy. Wood shavings and sawdust will act as both kitty litter and termite cocaine. So spread it far from your house. If you turn small things and you like using CA glue as a finish, be sure when you get all your parts you save the little baggies because they make perfect CA applicators. Just drizzle it on whatever your eyes and then just move it back and forth. Not only does it spread it out, but it smooths it out and they're disposable. If you spread out your oily rags on your lawn to dry out for safety reasons, usually the Cooper Copper will come around and take them away for you. One of the major problems with wooden hand planes people have is that the blade moves on them in use. How to fix that is to bed the blade. Meaning, take the blade out, grab some carbon paper, lay it in there, reassemble your plane, and use it for a little bit. And then disassemble it and look at the bed. Anywhere that the carbon paper is left a little black mark is actually a high spot that you need to remove so that the blade will fully seat against the bed. So, just remove that spot, reassemble it with the carbon paper, try it out again for a few swipes, disassemble it, and keep going until you get an even black spot all the way around from the carbon paper. That means your bed, your blade is fully bedded, it'll have the most contact, and it won't wiggle in use over time. I'm gonna fill these holes with inlay and use super glue as the binder. I'm gonna coat the surface around the hole with paste wax so the super glue doesn't stain the wood. Most Morris tapers are threaded on the end for you to screw into the hole in place if you're not pressing into them. I use one on my buffing wheel so that it holds it in place when I'm buffing my bolts. Oh, can you believe it? In this series, we have 263 of these tips. Yeah, not all of them were the greatest. Some of them were jokes, but 263 with 99 in this video alone. That'd all be worth something, right? Maybe a like or subscribe? <laughs> Anyways, I hope you all had fun with this. Learned a few things, had a little bit of laugh. But in the end, the biggest tip I can tell you is, remember, it's always worth the effort to learn this kind of stuff and share it with others. Y'all be safe and have fun.